To the world at large, Victor is known partly as a classicist and military historian, the author of books about Homer, Thucydides, and the Peloponnesian War, the techniques of ancient warfare, and the successful generals. And most recently, a capacious and deeply original book about the Second World War, copies of which, by the way, we have for all of you as you leave. Signed copies as well. Now, Victor is equally well known as a muscular and astonishingly productive columnist who weighs in with gimlet-eyed prose on a host of contemporary controversies, shaming naked would-be emperors and cutting through the rancid thickets of political correctness with that most uncommon of virtues, common sense. But I'd like, to, I'd like to say a word or two about another expression of Victor's energeia, to use an Aristotelian term. As I mentioned in my welcoming remarks, in addition to being a writer and a teacher, Victor is a farmer. In fact, he comes from a long line of grape farmers in California. Victor's connection to the soil is not adventitious. Two of his early books are about farming, one about the plight of small farmers in California, the other about the unrecognized contribution that ancient Greek farmers made to the formation of classical civilization. But of course, both are about more than farming, or rather, farming itself is about more than farming. When we think of the word culture, we are apt to think of something abstract, arty, ethereal. But Victor's work reminds us that culture comes from that capacious Latin word, colo, which means everything from live, dwell, inhabit, to care, tend, nurture, and promote the growth or advancement of. The cognate noun, cultura, means first of all the tilling or cultivation of the land and the care and cultivation of plants. But it too has ambitious tentacles signifying everything from the observance of a religious rite to well-groomed, which I'm happy to say all of you are, and chic, polished, and sophisticated, which I'm happy to say all of you are as well. It was Cicero who first gave currency to the metaphor of culture as a specifically intellectual pursuit. Just as Cicero writes, a field, however good the ground, cannot be productive without cultivation, so the soul cannot be productive without education. Philosophy, said Cicero, is a sort of cultura animi, a cultivation of the mind or spirit. It pulls out vices by the roots, he says, makes souls fit for the reception of seed, and sows in order to bring forth the richest fruit. Now it's springtime now, so the next time you're pottering about the garden, and encounter a packet of seeds. Take a look at the label that says, cultural instructions. And think about the reverberations of that word, cultural. Victor's rootedness in the soil echoes throughout his work, imparting to it a manliness, if I may still be permitted to use that term, <laughs> and an astringent level-headedness that inoculates his prose against the blandishments of panting utopian eagerness. <laughs> like the Victorian essayist Walter Badgett, Victor knows that, and I'm quoting Badgett now, history 
is strewn with the wrecks of nations which have gained a little progressiveness at the cost of a great deal of hard manliness and have thus prepared themselves for destruction as soon as the movements of the world uh, gave a chance for it. <clears throat> Victor's work is a clarion call against those forces of dissolution and destructiveness, a reminder that good intentions and good results are not necessarily the same thing. Now, I suppose that every age regards itself as a hinge of history, a turning point in the affairs of men. Such sentiments are a reliable part of the hubris of the moment, of our habit of taking ourselves and our times too seriously. And yet few observers can look around at the yeasty and cacophonous landscape of our culture without feelings of trepidation, vertigo, and alarm. Victor's embrace of permanent things informed by both the discipline of the classics and the lessons of the land impart a lucidity and self-possession to his writing that is as admirable as it is consoling. Edmund Burke captures the virtue I am thinking of in a famous and arresting image. Because, Burke writes, half a dozen grasshoppers under a fern make the field ring with their importunate chink, whilst thousands of great cattle reposed beneath the shadow of the British oak chew the cud and are silent. Pray, do not imagine that those who make the noise are the only inhabitants of the field, that of course they are many in number, or that after all, they are other than the little, shriveled, meager, hopping, though loud and troublesome, insects of the hour. Victor cuts across the chattering static of those ephemeral creatures, bringing us back to a wisdom that is as clear-eyed and disabused as it is generous and serene. I and my colleagues are as honored to welcome Victor Davis Hanson here tonight as we are proud to speak about Edmund Burke and his pertinence to these tumultuous times. Victor. Thank you very much, uh, Roger, for that kind introduction. I, I have to confess, when he said manliness, I got kind of scared because on the way here, I said to my wife, we were walking out in the orchard, and it was very nice on Saturday, and I said, well, I got to go to New York. I get claustrophobia. I get lost. I don't like it. I have to give all these lectures. I get nervous. And she said, oh, shut up, Eeyore. I'm getting tired of that. Every time you go to New York, you get excited, and you come back in a good mood, and you say you have more friends, and more people like you there than this place. They hate you here. So that wasn't very manly to, uh, to be called Eeyore by your own wife. But I thought, uh, you know, in this period of, we hear the word populist a lot, and often misused, and I was looking to see how many times Edmund Burke has been evoked by contemporary political observers and columnists and pundits, and almost as much as Alex de Tocqueville, and also the third one I found was Niccolo Machiavelli, and they're all, of course, used in the context of anti-Trump. Mach Trump embodies Machiavellian ruthlessness. Uh, unlike Edmund Burke, he's not a protector of tradition, and he represents uh, a crudity, probably true, that infects the constitutional system. And like Tocqueville, he doesn't understand the power of custom to tradition. One, and I thought one of the person who wrote this was also a very prominent New Yorker columnist. And he remember, I don't know if you remember, he wrote, I won't mention his name. He said that he didn't want to be arrogant, but he thought he knew more about Edmund Burke than any politician until he met Barack Obama, who embodied Burkean tendencies. And yeah, 
And so my point is that all three of those columnists are widely, all three of those writers are wi widely uh, mentioned today in this political climate, but I think not necessarily fairly, because they all have one thing in common. If you read The Prince or The Art of War or uh, Burke's Reflections on the Revolution in France or Tocqueville's Democracy in the Merit, they have great confidence in what I would call the middle stratum, the common sense people in England that were custodians of tradition and shopkeepers and had modicum of property and were not as liable to be infected by what this quality of result that was going on in France, or what Tocqueville contrasted the American yeoman with the European peasant, and he said that the word peasant really doesn't exist in America. It doesn't. And there's no word for it, by the way, in, in the Greek language or the, the Latin language. They don't have a concept of an indentured servant. And of course, uh, it's very important to remember this because we, we've been said that we've never seen anything like Trump. We've never seen anything like this populism. In fact, it's as old as the Greeks. Everything that we've seen is a replay in circular fashion of something that's well known. So there were two types of populism in the ancient world. And I think the, the thing to remember is what we now in the modern media and the press and the progressive movement called the bad populism used to be the good populism and what they call the good populism was the bad populism. By that I mean Occupy Wall Street and Antifa and Black Lives Matter and the Bernie Sanders in a linear tradition back to Catiline and Cleon and the 51 percent mob in Athens was considered bad then, now it's considered good, and the Reagan Democrat, the deplorables, the irredeemables, uh, the red stater has a tradition that goes back all the way to the founding of the Greek city-state. So it's kind of inverse, it's a little hard to do. What I mean by that is that if you take the former, there was this image in classical antiquity that the worst thing you could end up with would be a bipolar society of an elite and a mass without a middle, what they called the Mesoi, the Georgoi, the agrarians. And the city-state emerged on the protection of one thing. It wasn't equality. It wasn't even freedom. It was protection of property, the ability to own property and not have it compensated by the government and to improve it and pass it on with constitutional protections. And out of that grew in a progressive sense, democracy. But by the fifth century, the people who were the architects of that system looked at Corinth or Syracuse or Athens, and they had created a large detached population. And they didn't just call it the demos, they call it the aklos, which is a pejorative word for the mob. And just in Roman times, Latin doesn't really have a word for the demos, the populus, but the preferred term was the turba, something that was volatile. And the idea was that they were not uh, connected to a suspicion of the aristocratic hereditary class and the poor, they were just a binary. And they had a particular agenda, and you know what it was, if you read the Catiline Conspiracy or you read the Bread and Circuses Diatribes of Juvenile, it was redistribution of property, employment for everybody. That sounds familiar lately, doesn't it, with Bernie Sanders? <laughs> And uh, the other one is kind of eerie. Cancellation of debts. I just saw Bernie Sanders thought student loans should be all forgiven. And more, not less, government. And this is kind of a strange thing. They were all, believe it or not, imperialist. The Athenian demos and the, what Plato called the nautical crowd was really for a large permanent bureaucracy that would bring in capital from overseas and to urban areas. So we really see it in the Roman context where these people went out, the agrarians went out and f created this huge empire and then the influx of slaves and capital destroyed the Italian countryside and gave us Latifundia. And there's a great uh, passage, if I could indulge you, in Livy's history and he says, at one point they bring in this old man, about old in, the anti in antiquity, was 50. At 64, <laughs> I, I feel like I'd, I wouldn't be alive in the ancient world, but he takes, uh, his name is Spurius Ligustinus, and he says, I want to tell you people what I've been doing for you. And he's talking to the elite. And his body is a road map of Roman, Roman imperialism. And he, he names over the last 20 years that he fought in Spain. He fought in North Africa. He fought at Achaea. He fought 
in what is now France. And his point is, I did all of this for you people because I was a Roman citizen, and yet when I came home, the amount of capital and labor came in and destroyed the very system that produced me. That same type of populism was the catalyst for the revolutions of 1848. And, and the same agenda again and again, it was a Catiline agenda, it was, it was central to Marx's thinking. It, separ it explains the fraternity, the egalitarianism, the equality of result that characterized the French Revolution, that was a holistic notion that it, radical enforced equality by government mandate would govern or adjudicate every element of your life, from religion to art to economics, to culture, to politics, to military affairs. It was the basis for the Napoleonic Grand Army. And then, of course, in the modern sense, we see it, as I said, with these modern movements. But contrary to that, or antithetical to that, there was this other tradition that founded the city-states. And, and, and a very strange passage to the historian Thucydides, who was a very fair observer of Athenian democracy, there was a revolution in 411 of property owners that say, you know, we don't really want 51% of the people on any given day uh, making law. And this was very influential in people like David Hume and Edmund Burke, who looked at classics in a very different way than our modern classicists. They looked at what the trial of Socrates, the de debate at Mytilene, the execution of the Melians, and they thought that Athens had been a rogue nation because it had no constitutional protections uh, from the mob or the Yaklaws. And this revolution of, of, of 411, their argument was we should bring back a middle group and they should be the mesoi, the middle people, and they should have some property. I know that sounds, but you can see where the founding fathers were so influenced by it. And it was very influential in the, for all the complexity of the Gracchi, Tiberius Gracchus, and Gaius Gracchus, the idea that if you don't have a middle interior, rural, common sense check on urbanism and the accumulation of non-landed wealth, or you don't have a, a questioning of whether you should go out and become a citizen of the world. One of the great issues between these two populisms is whether you have sovereignty and exceptionalism, that you are a kiwi sum romanus, or you're a citizen of the empire, whether you're an Athenian or whether you're a Corinthian or you're just a citizen of Hellas. And in this other populism, the populism that I think has led to the red state and was the foundation of the American Revolution, you can see outbreaks, the Whiskey Rebellion, you can see uh, the Jacksonian movement, you can even see some of the demagogic aspects of it with William Jennings Bryan. I, I mentioned that name because when I was a young person, my grandmother, uh, who was a third generation farmer in our house, made all of us memorize the Cross of Gold speech, <laughs> which is kind of crazy. And, uh, and then she, uh, she said, if he had just been president, I said, now I can look back and see what a disaster it would have been. But nevertheless, he had an idea that there was a, an American exceptionalism and a background. That, that was lost, I think, lately. And we, and I speak that as someone at, at the Hoover Institution that we on the conservative side had defined conservatism not in a Burkean sense that you need custodians of tradition and custom to keep society honest and protect it from the bad populism that he saw in France or in what Tocqueville thought he had an immunity in the United States when he visited because there was this common sense and they weren't peasants and they weren't absentee landowners, they were these people who were invested in these rural communities. And it's very ironic that we saw these populisms clash in this election, the version of Sanders and the version, believe it or not, of Trump. And yet we said this was completely new and it was foreign, which I'd like to conclude with what would be the role of, of Donald Trump. He should, would have been an unlikely uh, advocate of any populism that dealt with the middle class given his own checkered personal history, but I mentioned this today in a speech. He was the first Republican candidate who used terms of endearment with the first person possessive. When, you, when they went into West Virginia, the two candidates, you remember that Hillary Clinton said, well, we're going to have to put a lot of miners out of business. And Trump said, <laughs> I'm, I'm laughing, but I don't mean to be cruel. He said, we like coal. We like beautiful coal. And these are our miners. And 
I don't think anybody else would have said that. Anybody who was a better, and, the, and all of the other alternatives had better character, they were more experienced, but yet there was, maybe it was a cunning, maybe it was an instinctual insight, but he saw that the good populism, the red state interior was essential to be a check on this radical progressive movement that is advancing geometrically, not arithmetically. And that, that, that's quite unusual. And I'd like to, to finish on what his role is. And we talked about it a little bit in a group. And I wrote uh, Jack Fowler and Rich Lowry once said to me about two weeks ago, why don't you, I mentioned the, the tragic hero. And of course, when you say Trump is a tragic hero or an epic hero, you, you kept, it stops conversation because you use the word hero. <laughs> but hero in the ancient, as the way Aristotle formulated in the politics and the way it was used, it doesn't mean that you're necessarily noble or you're moral or you're upright or you're doing something for humanity. What it means is you accomplish something that has those effects and it really is separated from the messenger. So in the Iliad, the first tragic hero we have, the apparat of Agamemnon and Menelaus, the deep state, they have a problem. They don't have... They don't have the skills to deal with the existential problem, and it's not Hillary Clinton, it's Hector. And nobody, nobody can do, they don't know what to do. They can follow all the rules that they have kingly prerogatives, but they need somebody who is a berserker. And they bring in this juvenile from the outlander areas of Mount Pelion, Achilles, and they put him in the right direction. He's whiny, he complains, and he does the job, and then that's the end of him. It's not going to end up well. It comes to its fruition in the plays of Sophocles, Antigone, Philoctetes, Oedipus, but if you think Trump is a whiner and craving public attention, read Sophocles' Ajax, <laughs> where poor little Aj old Ajax says, I'm the best warrior, and I was the bulwark of the Achaeans, and they gave the armor to Odysseus, and it's not fair, and they don't appreciate me, and it's sort of fake news, and he just complains all the time. And yet, nobody likes him. He has to commit suicide, but he, he was essential to stopping the Trojan horde. We see it in our own tradition, this tragic hero that has a connection with the, I think, the good populism, the, the idea of sovereignty and citizenship and middle class sobriety and stability. We have these strange people in our military history that appear. William Tecumseh Sherman, uncouth, bipolar, uh, not steady. We would all like George McClellan in times of peace. Ulysses S. Grant, for all of his drinking, was a more sober and judicious commander. And yet, he's the one that came up with the idea that I'm going to make Georgia howl. I'm going to Atlanta. They said, OK, he's, that's enough, Uncle Billy. And then he went to Savannah, that's too much Uncle Billy, and then he went up to the Carolinas and into the wars. Lincoln said, he went into one hole and I don't know where he's gonna come out. <laughs> and then after that, of course, when he had some utility and he understood what the American project was about, then we damned him as a terrorist. So much that we damned him. There are counties in the South that have into their property codes, you can't sell the property to a man named Sherman today. We see it with Curtis LeMay and George Patton. Uh, I'll just because we're running out of time. Curtis LeMay came in to a failed B-29 program, and he was trying to figure out how not to invade Japan. He didn't really know the progress of the atomic bomb, but he did know that this billion-dollar project was a failure. And he took the B-29s from 30,000 to 5,000, and he burned down 75% in a very horrific fashion of Japan. At the time, he was a national hero. They saw that cigar, uh, he had Bell's palsy, that's why he'd shoot it. And people said, he was on the cover of Time Magazine. Once the war was over, my God, Curtis LeMay burned down 75% of Japan. How did we let him do that? That's horrible. The fact that Japan was killing about 20,000 people in Asia and China per day, nobody cared after the war. And then he ended up the caricature of Buck Turgeson and General Ripper, as you remember in Dr. Strangelove. And so we have this ability to find these people from the netherworld or the outlining areas that represent a, a very American pragmatism. And we, in dire straits, we need them. And I'll finish with 
this is the stuff, isn't it, of the Western, and I, I tried to write about that this week, that whether you, I'm always taken back to Shane, the sodbusters are, are sort of the establishment, the Paul Ryans of the world, nice, great people, and they've got a problem. They've got ruthless, psychopathic, cattle-bearing killers. Shane comes in, and he's an outliner. He doesn't, he thinks he can work with these people. He thinks that they'll accept him. He says he tries to go, and then when somebody has to kill Jack Palance, it's going to be Shane, and the the fact that he had those skills is very suspicious. And the fact that he'll use them is even better, but it's also suspicious. But it will ensure that the sodbusters are okay and he's going to leave. And you can see it with Ethan Edwards and the Searchers, the Magnificent Seven. The modern tech context is my favorite is D Dirty Harry, who represents common sense Americanism, but we're very worried where he knew how to <laughs> shoot that gun and we don't want him to be turned loose uh, after he's got rid of the psychopathic mass murder. And I think in some ways, what we're watching out is an existential but long war in Western civilization for the hearts and minds of the state, the city-state, and we have an extreme version of equality of result and an urban uh, redistributionist mode versus uh, the antithesis. And we've somehow forgot that antithesis. We were so caught up with globalization, we were so caught up with rebuilding the world in our own image. We were so caught up in the material bounty in that globalization, I'm speaking as one who works in Silicon Valley near it, that we forgot that there was a whole group of people in the world, in the United States, in between, that didn't think that all that was very conservative. And they felt, whether it was justified or not, that they were Burkean custodians of what the American idea was. And ironically, we had some kind of crazy Ajax or crazy Ethan Edwards that came in to remind us of that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Victor. So Victor has agreed to answer a few questions. We have a few minutes. Um, <clears throat> but it's impossible to see anything from the stage, so I'm going to step down and I will point to people. There are a couple of people in the uh, audience who have microphones. Please wait till the microphone comes to you so uh, we can hear the question. Why haven't conservatives put forward the idea of property as an organizing principle that would combat racism? When I was a boy, my family moved to Levittown on Long Island. It was designed in such a way that no returning black soldiers could buy into Levittown. It strikes me as completely wrong in the history of Edmund Burke, an idea like that. No, you're, absol you're absolutely right, and, uh, and it works best when it's an organic process and not a government down. So one of the things that I think the message has been lost that we've had record record low Hispanic and African-American unemployment. We should be talking about that more importantly, but uh, if people have the capital to buy property, and I see it in my hometown where I've noticed where people come from Mexico and they're rent, a renter class, it's almost as if they're jumping out of the pages of Edmund Burke, and there's graffiti, there's high crime, and as soon as they start to buy homes, especially rural homes, the graffiti disappears, they come over to my house and they say, what are we gonna do about this gang member? And they're invested. And that was the idea, uh, as I said, that was completely the, the idea of a tema or a possession in Greek was the, it was, the, was the founding principle, not just of the city-state, but of Western civilization itself. And so what I, what I have been upset about, and I think you have too, is that somehow we got into a trap that we allowed creative destruction, which we know is the only, it's a very efficient, but we knew that it was destroying communities and taking property from people and creating a malaise in the center of the country. And somehow we justified that by saying, oh, get in the truck and go to uh, North Dakota and frack or learn encoding, but we're not gonna worry that you have to leave your grandmother and your third generation home. And, and, and we didn't understand that we were destroying the very Burkean essentials of, of what makes a stable society and the custodianship of our values. So I think it's very important, 
And one of the, my colleague at Hoover, every time I have lunch with him, all he talks about Tom Sowell is we need to have black property owners. That nothing will change until they own, that we have a majority that owns property. Uh, switching gears, perhaps, a little bit. Um, how is the uh, attempted coup and its revelations uh, going to play out, ultimately? In, in how, is, how are the revelations of the attempted coup going to play out? I, th I think all of us understand that not to, over, not to uh, overwork the Sophoclean an analogy, but Sophocles created this word ironeia, and it meant that once you pursue a particular path, it creates unintended consequences. So we watched this drama come out in this hysteria. We did what we thought we would never do. We were not going to have another Lawrence Walsh or Ken Starr or pa especially not a Patrick Fitzgerald, and yet we did. And then after the hysteria cooled, he found out very quickly that there was not collusion to the degree that it's, a, and Andy McCarthy has written eloquently, that it, it's a crime. I don't think it, as he defined it, it was. There was not obstruction of justice. There's probably not lying, at least egregiously so, to the FBI. There was not leaking, but that very ironic fact opened up a whole nother line of legal exposure. In other words, there was foreign subjects, a British subject, or not a citizen of the United States, bought information with Russian sources to warp an election. That is collusion. And people like Cheryl Mills and Uma Abedin and James Comey himself and Andrew McKay did not tell the truth to FBI investigators. And in the matter of leaking, James. James Comey may have leaked at least one or two secret or classified communications with the President of the United States. And, what, and a FISA, four judges were probably deceived in a sense that they were not given a complete, they either were not given a complete story of the dossier that was used to spy on American citizens, or they themselves, with a wink and a nod, did not request that in a, in a way that usually inquisitive judges might. And finally, we have the, United States government uh, either reverse targeted or surveilled people and somehow people like Samantha Power on 260 occasions asked for those names to be on mass. What the UN ambassador has to do with that, I don't know. And they appeared in the press. All of that was in some sense uncovered by Robert Mueller in an ironic fashion. He didn't find what he was looking for, but in the process of not finding what he wanted to find, he reminded all of us that he was on the right track. There was a lot of crimes. They just were right under our nose. Yeah. 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 Just a quick uh, question for you. Do we have any ancient uh, Greek parallels to our own time where it seems that truth is falsehood, falsehood is truth, up is down, down is up, there's no such thing as sex, men are women, women are men, and so on and so on and so forth. Well, there, there were these people called the Sophistae in late Sophists in late 5th century Athens, and they actually came to the conclusion, or their theory was that if they could make an argument and it was persuasive, they couldn't have done that unless it was true. And so they would try to make an argument they knew was false, but if, it was, if they could persuade people, and there, of course, the targets and the, the platonic corpus that Socrates is trying to argue that there is a absolute truth behind the universe, a, an ideal form, and it's not, it's not predicated on a social or an economic or cultural construct. It exists across time and space, and that argument of relativism versus an absolute truth is an ancient one, and unfortunately, we're in a sophistic period, aren't we, in the university where we feel that truth is in now in quotation marks and it's predicated on your proximity to power, whether you have capital or whether you're mon wealthy or whether you're a particular race or religion, rather than just truth. And so it's very dangerous. And the, the, the larger question I think you were suggesting is, what are the social conditions that allow such absurdities to thrive and become orthodoxy? And I, I think the ancients, if they could say something, is that the twins of leisure and affluence can be much more detrimental than, than hardship and, uh, and hard work. And we have a society that is, is, is becoming very affluent and very leisure. 
and it's kind of deprecated the idea of hard work. And that's another thing that I got so outraged when Hillary Clinton, I, I, I understand that natural gas is going to replace coal. When she looked at all those people and all these people who work, I don't think she has any idea what it is to go under the ground for t eight hours a day and say, you know, we're going to put a lot of you people out of work. And I thought, wow. In the back here. Yes. Since 1988, I have volunteered for the food bank year after year. Just recently, like in the last week, there was a meeting of people who work for the volunteers for the food bank, and they discussed the following issue, that every year, for almost 30 years, we have talked about the acute need for the food bank. But this year, it's changed because the unemployment in Maryland has, for the Maryland Food Bank, for, for the whole state, the unemployment rate has sunk so much that the acute need for the food bank has simply totally changed. I think that's a snapshot of what happens when an economy has not achieved 3% growth since 2006, and now it's, it's probably have three consecutive quarters. California just... California just recorded the lowest unemployment rate. And again, what we're, what we're upset about is uh, that with all of our correct economic dogma, we lost ideas of how these things affect people. So we, we said if you were never Trump or Trump was awful, we didn't ask ourselves what would his policies do to people like you're talking about versus the status quo, what it was, had already done to them. And so when I leave Selma, which per capita income is 16,000, my hometown, and Palo Alto is about 110,000 per capita, it, there was a big divide and there was just absolute anger and depression the last 10 years. Now I see, I cannot believe it. There's tilers wanted, plumbers wanted, lathe workers wanted, long haul truck, everywhere that I know. And I have farmers who used to say, if I don't get illegal aliens, I can't, I can't work and this minimum wage is killing me. I could never afford it at $12. And now they're saying, I've got to go find second generation guys at Walmart. I'll pay them $16 an hour to come out and work. And I think that's a good thing. Even though it's, we're going to cost, what I'm getting at is it's an, what you're talking about is another aspect to the human side of absolutely sol solid and sound conservative principles but somehow in the last, I mean, we lost seven out of the late eight last presidential elections, with at least the popular vote. Nobody won 51% since George H.W. Bush in 1988. There was something wrong in our presidential process that was not able to appeal to people, even though we had done very well at the local and state level. And so, again, it's very ironic that it took somebody with Trump's background to put a more human face on a principle that we'd forgotten about. You just don't write off half the country and say they're losers of globalization. Yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Victor, for your wonderful remarks. Um, I really enjoyed them. And I, as a classical conservative, I, I'm reassured by the idea that our problems are reflected in the same kinds of problems of 2,500 years ago. Yeah. Um, my question is simple, and it, it's the idea of Achilles and Hector. Do you think that the need for Achilles is a flaw of the Greek self-government, or is it a feature? Well, I think what happens in all bureaucracies, all consensual societies, that we get complacent, and we have certain norms of behavior, and we separate ourselves from this dark Manichaean world out there and that we are too uh, sophisticated, we're too nuanced, we don't look at the world the way that our grandparents did. When I got, I was brought up by a World War II veteran when I was a snotty 18-year-old, and I said, you helped drop the bomb? He said, all that matters is 51%. That's all the world's about. You have to be better than the alternative. Somehow we forgot we had to be, per we had to be, to be good, we had to be perfect. And so we over-refined, we over-adjudicated, we over-argued everything. And this maniac came in 
and he destroyed the entire political discourse, and we considered him uncouth and crude, accurately so, but we never ask ourselves would be the net result of a chance of self-reflection, that we had created him. And we blamed everything, and he was crude, but uh, in some ways, he, as I, I, I said, he was a chemotherapy, and it was designed to kill the cancer one day before it killed us, and I think it's working. Thank you very much. Thank you, Victor. Victor, don't go away quite yet. Uh, so, so, so we're coming. We're coming to the end. Uh, but I wanted to, um, Victor. We we tried to find an appropriate uh, book for you, and I tried to find a first signed edition of the Peloponnesian War, but we couldn't find that. <laughs> but, <clears throat> but we did find a, a, a nice two-volume first edition of Ulysses S. Grant's uh, memoir oh boy, thank for you. you. And uh, thank you very much. we'd like you to have it. Uh, it's, it's my pleasure now to, to um, in invite our executive editor, James Smero, to come to the stage and make a few parting recognitions. A few words of thanks. A long, long time ago, back when the New Yorker magazine had a funny bone, <laughs> Robert Benchley joked that the freelance writer is a man who is paid per piece, or per word, or perhaps. <laughs> well, I see many writers for the new Criterion in the audience tonight, and this evening is a celebration of their efforts. Let's give them a hand. In the idea of a literary review, an essay published in 1926 in the first iteration of The New Criterion, T.S. Eliot wrote that a review should be an organ of documentation. That is to say, the bound volumes of a decade should represent the development of the keenest sensibility and the clearest thought of 10 years. Now, for 36 years, this has been our mission at the new New Criterion. By recognizing the work of our great honoree, you honor all of our efforts. On the staff of the magazine, we are fit but few. Yet working for a year, my colleagues assemble this remarkable event all in-house. Roger and I would like to recognize them now, and I hope that they will stand as I call out their names. Andrew Beck, Rebecca Hecht, Ben Riley, Mary Ross, Andy Shea, Eric Simpson, and Austin Stone. Ladies and gentlemen, the editors and staff of The New Criterion. And now, for a final toast, he is known around here as the chairman of the board, Mr. James Pearson. Thank you, thank you, James. Uh, as chairman of uh, the new criterion, I can attest that this institution is in great shape, intellectually, editorially, and most importantly, financially. For 36 years, it has upheld the best that has been thought and said in Western civilization. Uh, it's pervaded the highest standards in civilization in a time that is, if not dark, certainly not bright. So let me raise a glass to Roger Kimball, the staff of the New Criterion, the stable of writers of the New Criterion, to all those assembled tonight, to Victor Davis Hanson. Thank you, Victor. Thank you very much for all of your work. Thank you. Here's to the new criterion. Thank you. Well, as Prospero said at the end of near the end of the Tempest, our revels now are ended. Not quite really, but this portion of our revels are ended. Please stay here as long as you like, and the bar will be open um, outside, so I hope we'll be able to continue the conversation. But again, just to echo James and uh, the two James's comments, thank you all so much for making this evening such a splendid success. Thanks. Thank you.